And so then you go to the police and you ask them for help and they say, there's no help for you. Right? So in the very beginning, it was um, scary, confusing, lonely, right? Um, but at some point, you realize, I cannot change this, right? There's nothing I can do about it. So I decided that um, I wanted to leave Arizona and move all the way across the country again, 1,000 miles back to Pittsburgh to live with my mother and her family. Okay. I, I had hoped um, I would get more support there. So that's when I, I decided to leave Arizona and um, go to Pittsburgh because I wanted to be myself all the way and not try to hide myself. So I thought maybe that would be the best way to do that. Okay. So I know uh, your parents being who, who, who they were. How did, you, how did they receive you knowing that you are gay now? Uh, my father said, was confused. He, he, I remember he said, uh, actually, the, the, the night before my wedding, I right, remember uh, I told you that I, I was, uh, had a husband. Right? I, I married a man. Um, we were together for a very long time and then got, you know, later in life it was legal to be married in, in Connecticut, so we got married. And so at, at the dinner before the wedding, my father said uh, uh, he did not understand it, right? But then he came to a realization that he did not understand it. it doesn't, he doesn't need to understand it. He just needs to love me for who I am. And it was a nice thing that he said at my wedding, but that was 30 years later, <laughs> right? In the moment, uh, he did not take it well. He didn't understand it, and he wanted to uh, beat the feminine out of me. He wanted to make me strong, make me like a man and not like a girl. So um, in the beginning, it was weird for him. It took him a long time to come around. My mother, very religious, Catholic religious. So when I first moved there, I still didn't tell anybody because I knew it wasn't accepted. It wasn't a good thing to be gay. So I didn't tell anybody for a, a while, a couple of years. Right? My friends knew, people at school knew, um, I was myself there, but at home I did not talk about that. I talked about how much I liked this new girl, even though there was no girl that I liked because I like boys, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I hid uh, at home, um, but eventually my mother figured it out, and she was very clear that it was a, a Catholic household. If I could not you know, give a, an example of a good Catholic you know, a person, because I was the oldest son, there was four of us, it was my job to set a good example and help raise them, especially raise them as religion and Catholic. So she told me if I could not be a good Catholic and stop being gay, what the heck does it even mean, right, that I had to leave. So I left. I was, must have been 16, 17 years old. I left and I moved into the house with my boyfriend and his parents. Okay, I think you need to, to tell me more about that because you are talking about a wedding, you are talking about um, a boyfriend, you are talking about moving in. A lot. So how, did you move, how did you get this boyfriend and how old was he? Okay, so <laughs> that story is a little bit, um, I guess the word is sordid. Right? Remember I told you I uh, did not follow the rules. Okay. Right? Um, so I knew that I was gay and I knew that I wanted to find other people that were gay. And um, the only place that I could figure out to go find uh, other gay people was gay bars, right? Um, so it's a bar where adults go drinking alcohol and hang out together. And there were bars that were just for gay people. And um, the particular bar that I wanted to go to, uh, once a week they, had, they held a special event for people 18 and over, right? So if you were 18 years old, you could come be at the bar and hang out, but you could not drink alcohol. Okay. Right? People 21 and over, they could drink alcohol. I was only 16, okay. so I make my own fake ID. Right? I went and made a fake ID that said I was 18, okay. so I could sneak in. Okay. Right? So I would sneak in and you know, go dancing and having fun and meeting people. And um, Somewhere in the middle of that, uh, apparently, uh, someday he will become my boyfriend and someday later he will become my husband. But this, this guy named Bill apparently noticed me and wanted to, you know, be, date me, I guess. So, um, but he was smart. <laughs> he watched me for a couple of years and he waited until I was 18 years old to ask me on my first date, right? So that was smart of him because at 16 years old, I could have got a lot of men in trouble if they tried to hang out with me or try to date me because I was not 18. Yeah. And dating somebody under 18 is one thing very bad. But dating somebody gay under 18 was terrible, so they could get in a lot of trouble. 
Um, so anyway, my, 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 I guess we'll call him my boyfriend at the time. He was smart. He waited till I was 18. He asked me out on my first date. And I went out on my first date with him. I know in a normal relationship, not in a normal, let me say, in a straight relationship. I appreciate you saying it that way. Yeah, yeah. in a straight relationship, uh, the girls play difficult when you want to date them. So did you play difficult? It's funny that you say that. Um, yeah, it seems to be the tradition that, that uh, uh, the, the, the girl would play difficult to get. Um, I, I did not. For me, it was like the first person that was giving me attention. Right, the first person that was giving me attention for the real me, not the me that I was pretending to be, so I didn't get picked on. Um, so right away, I said yes. Okay. Did not, I did not play hard to get at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. But so, it's funny yeah. that you mentioned like there, there's like roles like in the heterosexual world, like the the female is one way and the male is one way, and it's always the male asks the female. Yeah. Right, and they take each other out. Right? The male buys the dinner, the female comes along. Right? The male drives, the female sits in the passenger seat of the car. It's always the male-female role. Yeah. Right? Um, and for some reason, I don't know why, I always naturally fell into what heterosexuals would call the feminine role. Okay. Right? He was always the masculine role. He was the one with the car. He asked me out. He paid for everything. I was, I guess for you, we call the feminine side of the role. Okay. So how did you come to plan for the wedding and how was the wedding? Where was it? So that became many years later. So the, the story that you, you've told that would be a, a blockbuster video, right, um, happened for, for uh, 18 years. Right, so he and so I... you were married for 18 years? No. Okay. So uh, marriage was not legal in the United States, right? So when we first met, um, depending on where we were, we were just friends. We would tell people we were just friends, traveling together. Um, and other places, it was okay, and we were open and said, you know, we're together. You know, we are a partnership. But there wasn't a word for it, right? So if it was legal, we would be husband and husband. Um, and for us, the word boyfriend and dating didn't say what our relationship was. So we had no word for it. But we were together. We were together in a committed relationship. And we stayed that way for 18 years. And then uh, 18 years later, suddenly, the laws in America were changing and it was a, a little bit more okay to be gay and there were some states, not very many, one or two states that passed laws making it legal for two men or two women to get married. Okay. Right? And it just so happened that Connecticut was one of those states and it also just so happened that my husband had a business that was expanding and one place it was expanding was Connecticut. So we'd been together 18 years, right? We loved each other. We, you know, raised families of dogs together, right? My dogs were like my children to me. And then suddenly we're in Connecticut with a business trying to make it work and the laws change. It's, it's illegal to be married. And so we're like, let's do it, yeah. right? So there was no proposal. Nobody got on their knees with a ring, right? We had been together 18 years. It was just a decision that let's do this. Let's make history, mm -hmm. right? We'll be one of the, the first gay couples in the United States to ever get married. So uh, we got married. And it just so happened that two years later, we ended up breaking up and uh, getting separated and uh, everything changed after that. So okay. was, for me, it was weird because we were together for so long and then we get married, it's over. Yeah. That was weird. Okay. So you've talked about, okay, you know, you are the first gay person I'm talking to. No, so really? I'll, yeah, I'll ask many questions Good. that are innocent. So you, you talk about... Um, is it a husband-wife relationship or a husband-husband relationship? How does it work? It's definitely different for every single couple. And uh, for me, it started out as a husband-wife relationship. So where, you are the wife? Yeah, in my role, in my mind, I played the wife role, the, the feminine role. Okay. Um, because that's how I was raised, mm -hmm. right? Every uh, adult couple in my life, my father and his, his second wife, you know what I mean? My grandfather and my grandmother, my mother's mother, her father, my aunts and my uncles, they all had the very same relationship. The man worked, the female stayed home and take care of, you know, the household. If you have kids, the female stayed home and take care of the kids. So that is the way I did it, right? For some reason, I decided it was just natural to me to be the feminine role. And for him, it was the masculine role. So we did that forever. And then, but as towards the end, we started evolving understanding that I don't need to pay, play a feminine role, 
And so we tried to make things a little more equal. Right? I tried to talk about you know, both having an equal role. So I would, I would work more. I would put more money into the household. I would get to make more decisions about the household. But that was 18 years later. Okay. Yeah, for the first 18 years, very clearly, he played what would be considered a masculine role. And I played what would be considered a feminine role. Okay. You know, uh, as I said, I'll ask many questions. I'm excited yeah. for you to ask the question. That's really yeah. cool. How do you read the Constitution in a gay relationship? So, first you have to explain to me, what do you mean by read the Constitution? No, uh, you see, to, to, you know, it's a coded. Yes. Okay, now I understand. Yeah. Um, navigating sex was easy for us because we didn't think about it as something you have to, like, converse about. It wasn't something you have to have, like, a decision about because I cannot get pregnant. So there is no, like, we talk about sex and we plan sex. It's just something that was normal. It was easy and it happened whenever it happened. And just like boys do, it happened a lot. So how would it happen and yet both of you are men? Um, it's funny that you would ask that question. For me, I just went naturally. So for most people, it starts out the same. You, you have, uh, you know, kissing and touching. And then it went further and further. Um, in the beginning, I would take what you would consider the feminine role, and he would take what is the masculine role. In, in the, the gay community, when we're talking about sex, we would say he is the top, right? And I was the bottom, which means he is the giver, and I am the receiver, okay. right? Is that, okay. yeah. you know what I mean? Um, but very quickly, um, I realized that what I wanted sexually was not only to receive, Right? I wanted also to give. Yeah. Okay. So, and that happened normal. For in a, in a gay relationship, you don't say, oh, you can only give because you are the man. Mm -hmm. And I can only receive because I am the feminine or female. It just mixes and matches. Okay. Maybe let me put it this way. Now, you talked about husband-husband relationship. So it means at one point you could be the husband, and another point he could be the husband. Something like that. Yes. So for what's happening for you is the word husband carries very specific ideas of gender specific and the word husband carries with it ideas where like the man is one way and the female is another way and together they fit together as the perfect picture of a relationship right yeah. and for us we don't think like that right it isn't the man is one way and the female is one way it's two people they are together as a relationship and there isn't a division of gender roles right it's just as a team Okay. That's what's different. Okay. You said that uh, you had businesses together. Mm -hmm. So when you divorced or when the marriage collapsed, what happened, what, what happened to the businesses? Did you share or what happened? <laughs> so there would have to be profit or money to share. There was none because uh, at the same time our marriage was breaking, um, also his company was breaking. He was uh, going bankrupt, right? Um, but actually, the company was 100% his. Like, he, he did all the money, the money was the company's, you know, he got paid a paycheck and brought the money home to me and we shared the money. Um, so, I was not a part of the business, um, but when... I, I, he made enough money, I did not have to work. I was okay. what we would call, the joke was I was one of the desperate house husbands of Harrisburg okay. because the new thing on the TV show back then was the desperate housewives. Okay. So there's always, you know, a bunch of ladies, they don't have to work, their men make all the money and they stay home and they be pretty and do pretty things and that was my life, right? So when he would go away in business, I would consider myself his uh, personal assistant, okay. you know? Yeah. He would, I would follow him on business and I would make sure his suits were ironed and he looked good and I helped him get dressed in the morning. I made sure he had lunch, you know what I mean? He would do business, I would take care of the children and the dogs and keep the, either the hotel room or the house clean and ready for him, that kind of idea. So I supported him differently that way, like as a, as a wife would support him, not as a business partner. So when the company broke, all of it was his, none of it was mine. Okay. So there was no money to be had okay. from the company. So after, after the relationship ended, did you used to miss him or it ended and ended like that? Definitely did not end fast. Um, what I realize and what a lot of other men, adults, tell me is the, the one thing about divorce is it is never final. It never officially ends. The relationship does not end. The definition of the relationship changes. We are now living separate lives, but we're still joined. We have 
20 years worth of finances that are joined, right? We have a house that is joined that, uh, you know, he kept and I left. Um, we have credit cards, finances. It should be riches that we would share, but it was not riches. It was debt. Yeah. There was a lot of debt that we shared. So my relationship with him as a human, my relationship with him, let's say as friends, continued because it had to. We shared custody of the dogs. So sometimes it was my turn to take care of the dogs. Sometimes it was his turn to take care of the dogs. Just like in a heterosexual relationship, sometimes the children are with the mom and sometimes the children are with the dad. So it never ends. Okay. Um, the rapport that we had changed very quickly. Before it was a very loving rapport and now it was a... At first it felt like a business rapport. You know, we, we just kept it professional, tried to separate emotions from it. Um, but, uh, you know, it wasn't, it, it went on forever. The relationship stayed forever until the very end. You know, I, I would see him, in the beginning I would see him at least once a week because we have to talk about the dogs and hand the, the children, we call them our children, okay. right? So our children went back so we saw each other. And then eventually um, things didn't go so well for him. So he was uh, doing too many drugs and ended up in jail. So I didn't see him for a while. Um, and then when he got out, everything was different. Now, I want you to tell me, uh, in a gay relationship, what attracts a man to another man? What would be the reason why a man would be attracted to another man? Um, so that's just natural within me. Do you know what I mean? Um, just like all females, you know, they're, if they're attracted to a man, they see different things in each man they are attracted to. And two females can see two very different things that they are attracted to. So to answer that question, um, is difficult because it's not just what a man is attracted to, it's what I was attracted to. You know what I mean? So for me, what attracted me to a man was uh, strength, security, confidence, money. Yeah, I do not want to work. Girls did not work. Little perfect little girls and princesses did not need to work because they had a man to take care of them. And in my mind, that's who I wanted to be was the perfect little princess who did not have to work. Mm -hmm. So for me, what attracted me to the man was the security, the strength, you know, um, money, of course, you know, a good hard worker. That's what I was attracted to um, emotionally. When it comes to physically and sexually, I was attracted to anything that was a man. <laughs> I had no very specific type. Um, so your question is like, what, what, is, what attracts a man to another man? And the answer would be the same thing that attracts a female to another man, which is a, a variety of things that is different per person. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because I know like in a straight relationship, there may, there may be the issue of looks, that, that that guy is handsome or that lady is beautiful. So for me, looks were about sex, not about love. Love and relationship was about, you know, connection. And for me, I was taught, you know, all, all Catholic girls marry a man who can support them, take care of them, uh, protect them, you know, make them feel secure and provide for them, right? So those are the things that I look for because that's what all of the females in my family looked for in men. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know why for me looks were separate from relationship. It's mm -hmm. not like that for most people. Mm -hmm. um, and I certainly wasn't raised that way. I think that's just who I was naturally. Mm -hmm. For me, Looks have never been important. Okay. Never have been. Okay. So, I think that what you're trying to say is, do I have a type? I think that's yes. what we say, yes. right? So, you're like, do I have a type? Yeah. Right. Because, like, I know, for most ladies, if you are a man and you are muscular, tall, you're muscular, yeah. right, yeah. chiseled features. Yeah, actually, in Kenya, they say tall, dark, and handsome. That's Same thing we say here: tall, dark, and handsome. Right. But when we say dark, we mean hair, eyes. You know, not skin. Right? So, so that's the same thing. We say tall, age. dark, and handsome. What is most females prefer? Tall, dark, and handsome. Okay. Um, I don't have a, a like a, a type. Um, the joke, that, <laughs> the joke that my husband and I would say would be, we don't have a type, but there are a certain type that we would spend extra money on. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like if we're trying to get your attention and and you, we want you to come home and have sex. Um, you know, you buy more drinks and you buy more stuff and take them on nice fancy dates to convince them to stay with you. So uh, for us, a type that we would spend extra money on would be, we call them twinks, okay. right? And so a twink would be uh, uh, a younger guy that was, you know, skinny, 
a, a feminine looking younger guy is basically what a twink would be. Mm-hmm. And that was our type. But it wasn't really a type. That was just, they were, they, for some reason, they were extra special and we would spend more effort on them. But we really have no type. For me, I don't. Okay. Most people have a specific type. But it's very different in the gay community. There's, you know, very many different types. And all of them are equally um, desired. Oh, yeah, I was a professional dancer. So you can see that's the definition of a, a twink. Oh, you so know? this is you. That is me, oh God, 25 years ago. Okay. Right? And then as a ballet dancer also, you can see young, I had no chest hair, I have okay. no ch- you know, belly hair, I have no, no, so that's what they would call a twink. And then many years later, I grew into what we call a bear, okay, right? Which is okay. a gay guy that is, you know, big and has furry and a belly and is, you know, big and masculine. Okay. So now the question, the other question I had that had disappeared is, in a straight relationship, you will uh, find people call something nil by mouth. So nil by mouth, it means uh, the man and the woman are not talking. For one reason or another, uh, you just get home and the man is not feeling like talking to you. Okay. The woman is not feeling like talking to you. So in a gay relationship, in a gay marriage, do you have such instances where your partner is not willing to talk to you? Absolutely. And then how do you resolve? Um, my first marriage, I was young. So resolving that was not natural or understandable so back then it's just like most relationships we fight we yell try to figure out what's going on nowadays i'm old enough and my, my, the new relationship i have here with joey is different whenever uh we have uh, how do you say it N- nil by mouth yeah nil by mouth is like uh, we're not talking you're not talking yet. right so we, we say arguing even though which is silly because arguing means you are yelling at each other but sometimes arguing means we're not speaking at all okay. um, or we're having a misunderstanding um, so now that I'm older, I've learned that it's much easier just to talk and communicate and work our way through it, just like any other uh, heterosexual relationship. I think when it comes down to uh, the emotional part of relationships and the difficult work that you need to put into relationships to make them good and to make them work, it's the same, heterosexual or, 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 or gay relationship. Right? We, I don't think gay people attack a relationship or try to make a relationship good any differently than heterosexual people. Um, But maybe that's the new America, because I know if I'm thinking right now, I'm thinking about my grandma, my aunt, my mother, when they had arguments or had just, you know, disagreements, it was mostly the man that would say, okay, it's this way and that is it. And the female didn't have much say or choice. So maybe that's what you're asking. Typically, in the, in the past, I guess the, 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 the husband would make a decision and say, okay, that's it. Um, 30 years later now, things are very different. Mm-hmm. Even, even in heterosexual relationships, the man and woman are equal. Even if the man is working and the female is staying at home, they're still equal in the relationship, the, 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 the way things go. Um, even now today, you know, that, that you know, both mother and father, they are working. And they are equal financially and they are equal within you know, the power or the say of the relationship. So that's how I've, I do it now, okay. or always have done it, actually. Okay. So now, for you as uh, Jason, if you meet a beautiful woman, what happens? You just see this the woman is beautiful. Do you get attracted? So, yeah, so nowadays we're starting to realize that uh, romance can be separate from sex, right? So I would be called homo-romantic, but... Uh, bisexual or omnisexual, right? Um, so when it comes to romance, relationships, I prefer men. Okay. But when it comes to just sex, I have no preference. I love women in, in sex. I love men in sex. I love trans men, which is, you know, maybe we can call this a third kind of uh, gender, right? I love trans women, right? So nowadays the idea is there is not two genders. There is more than two genders, okay. right? And I have no preference of the genders sexually. You know, when it comes to just fun, okay. I have no preference. Okay. But romance, definitely, I personally have a preference of, of men. Okay. So when it comes to a female, yeah, I'm very attracted if she's my type, right? Also, now you have a type. When Funny, women. right? I do have a type when it comes to women. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for when it comes to women, um, I prefer women that are uh, fit, thin, um, 
not too big of breasts. I don't like big breasts. You know, I like proportion women. Um, I don't, I don't prefer women that are large. I don't prefer, prefer women that are strong. Um, I prefer women that are, that are petite compared to me. Okay. Right. So I'm still in my mind. I'm still this idea where the man is strong and the man takes care of the female is in the back of my head, I guess. Um, so yeah, weird. I have a type for women, huh? Okay. <laughs> but now, uh, now that you're in a new relationship, uh -huh. you're married to, to your, your current partner. Don't so we're you? not married. Okay. Right. So, um, we're huh. from my Catholic family. We're horrible because we're living together and we're not married. Okay. Right. You should not do that in a relationship when it's good Catholic, even though we're both men. Right. A man and a woman do not live together until they are married in the Catholic religion. So half of my family wouldn't possibly say <gasps> that's a bad thing. Um, so it makes it hard to define because officially we're just dating. Okay. But you're not supposed to live together when you're dating. Right? Yeah, but you know when you talk of Catholic, I know in Catholic we say, I, I'm also Catholic. Yeah, probably and, a different mm. kind of Catholic, I think, maybe. Yeah, because in Catholic we say sex before marriage is wrong. Very wrong, yeah. yes. So how, what kind of relationship do you have with him? Sex before marriage, yeah. So, um, it's difficult to define our relationship. We live as though we are husbands. We live in a relationship that looks like we are married. But we are not married. Um, our finances are separate. You know what I mean? Our households are separate. Um, I, when it comes down to like medical rights, we have no medical rights over each other, right? So it's weird here in the United States, especially if you live in a place where gay is not okay. Um, it, we li I guess we would call it a precarious place, our relationship. Like if he would get hurt and go to the hospital, I would not be allowed to visit him. Okay. in some places in the United States, yeah. right? So not being married and living together in a strong relationship gets weird. Um, it's funny that you say that because you said that w you're married to Joey. And uh, a long time ago, before marriage was legal, that's what we would say as gay people. This is my husband. Mm. Even though we were not married, yeah. I would refer to him as my husband because I want everybody to know what kind of relationship we had. Yeah. Right? He was not my boyfriend. He was more than just a boyfriend. We were not just dating. Okay. We were together as a couple. So we said the word husband. Mm -hmm. um, Joey and I do not use that word. Okay. We're still just figuring each other out and getting to know each other. And, you know, yes, we live together, but we're still more likely just dating. Okay. Maybe you can say engaged. Okay. But we're not that far yet. I have no, I did not make any promise of marriage yet. So not, not officially engaged. Okay. You talked about the kind of women you like. Yeah. So don't you think when you bring those women into your life, you hurt him? So that is possible. Um, if we would have a monogamous relationship, right? Monogamy and marriage don't go hand in hand in the gay community, right? It's not always monogamy. Um, it is, for my culture, in the gay culture, it is quite normal to be married and still have sex with other people. That is okay. okay. And it is quite normal in the gay community to be married and bring more people in to have sex together in, in groups of three or more. Okay. Right? Okay. Um, and then there's the idea of polyamory, which means love many. So there, there are some in the gay community where um, there are three people married. Right? So poly, many, uh, in, in love together. And then there are some relationships where they are married, but one has their own relationship on the side. Right? So we're together, but he's also together over here. Um, so the idea of monogamy is not a thing. There are some gay people. We call them the, the white picket fence. Yeah. You know, the, the, the American dream. You know, I want a house with a white picket fence, a dog. We are monogamous. We have one child. That idea, mm -hmm. right? There are some gay people that are that way. Okay. Um, Joey and I are not that way. So it, when I bring home a female or, or if I bring home another male, um, he's not hurt at all. He's excited because he gets to join okay. and have more fun. Okay. It's very different, yeah? <laughs> very, very different. Because at least I'm lucky to have known your partner. And I know, uh, from the way I know him, many women like him. Yes. D don't you feel jealous when you see many women around him? No. No. Um, he's he's the, the pretty one, right? So many women find him attractive at work. 
um, in the world out there, there are plenty of women that find me attractive, right? There are plenty of men that find me attractive and plenty of men that find him attractive. So I don't feel jealous. Um, I enjoy it. It's fun to watch the females be very about him. And he's not as much like me, right? He's still young. He hasn't tried sex that many times and he has never had sex with a female. Oh. I have, right? He has not. So it's hilarious to me to watch these females go, oh, Joey. And in his mind, he's like, whatever. You know what I mean? He's just, that's not his thing. Yeah. Um, jealousy when it comes to non-monogamy. For us, it, it, it's there, but it's not like a thing that makes decisions for us. It doesn't drive our decision-making process. For me, jealousy is like, ooh, he's with somebody else. That's exciting. I'm jealous. I want to join. Like, just like on the playground, I'm jealous that the kids are on the, on the swing set. I want to join on the swing set. Yeah. For me, it's the same way. Yeah. I'm jealous that he has another friend that is a male or whatever they are. And, uh, you know, I'm excited and jealous and want to join. Okay. So, uh, in terms of now religion, because you've said that uh, you are Catholic, how does... Was Catholic. Oh, you are Catholic, yeah. okay. Yes. Uh, so, did you stop because of being gay or what made you stop? How did the church receive you as a gay personality? Uh, <laughs> and the church officially did not know I was gay, right? And I, my grandfather, I guess I would consider the patriarch of the Catholic section of the family, right? I did not tell him I was gay. Because uh, I remember uh, like when I first started getting picked on, bullied at school, I, I asked for help. And this time it was different. My family wanted to help. You know what I mean? They wanted to protect me from the bullies. So my grandfather asked me, first he needs to know, are you actually gay or not? Because if you're actually gay, we have to take a different route, which meant, you know, changing. They tried to make me change, to go through, I guess they call it conversion therapy, right? Um, so I knew instantly that I did not want to do that. So I lied and said, no, I am not gay. Yeah. So they said, okay, then the, the, then the, the new path would be to attack the boys that were attacking me so they no more attack me. So I knew that being gay wasn't accepted, at least within the confines of the definitions of the religious part of the family. Okay. Right? So I, I stayed, what we say, in the closet. I didn't say anything. So the Catholic religion accepted me just fine because in their mind I was straight. I was a heterosexual. Um, there's several things that led up to me I guess you could say losing my religion, losing my faith. Um, first and foremost was science and education, right? The, the, the way I was being taught science in school and the way I was uh, getting my education, it became quite apparent to me that the Bible did not align with science. A God, any om omnipotent being did not align with science and science made sense to me. Right? Math made sense, science made sense, there was rules, there was laws, you know, it made sense. Um, so there was that, and then you add to that idea that I was gay and they said gay was wrong. Um, and I knew in my heart, in my heart I knew I was not bad. Mm. I knew I was not bad. And they kept telling me I was bad. And that just didn't make sense to me, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and for a while I still believed in a God and I had a, you know, I prayed and I had a relationship with my God. Mm. And I knew I wasn't wrong. Why would they tell me that he thinks I am wrong? It didn't make sense, yeah. right? Though that did not jive with me. So, and then you add to that a very specific experience that I had, and it was that experience, that one moment that changed my mind completely forever. That is it. I am done. I am no longer religious. I am no longer Catholic. Um, that one event is what we say is the straw that broke the camel's back. Do you know? Have you yeah, heard that yes, saying? Yes. Right. So that was the the, the the final straw that broke the camel's back, and uh, that one moment was uh, my youth minister, my youth pastor. So um, at the same time, I was trying to go through Catholic and become, you know, how we do all the, the steps, you know what I mean, confirmation and, you know, and, and the rest that go up the, what, what was it I had to do? I had to do my Holy Communion, confirmation, and what's after that? Uh, it's basically the baptism, Holy Communion, mm -hmm. uh, and confirmation. Yes, right. And uh, baptism starts when you're a baby. Yes. Confirmation starts very young. You should be confirmed, what, at seven, eight, nine years old, somewhere around there? Yes. It did not happen that way for me because I lived with my dad in Arizona. So for me, I came to Pittsburgh and confirmation was like, shh, 
he didn't have it. So it was, I was 15 years old, but I was in class with children, baby mm -hmm. children, right? So it was fast, fast. You know, my, my, my grandfather didn't want anybody to know that I hadn't gone through the Catholic cataclysms yet. Um, so it was rush, 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 high, quiet, quiet, quiet. So during that, I was 15 years old, not a baby, learning and speaking and talking to the youth minister, right? And at the same time, I was dating the man that would one day become my husband, right? And uh, so one of the things that we would do on a date was go to a park, right? And, uh, and the park was called Shenley Park. And uh, there was an area in the park where gay people would hang together, mm. right? Mm. And it was kind of secret. Like if there was too many gay people hanging out in one group, the police did not like that. They would break it up, right? So it was kind of like clandestine, kind of secret. So you would drive your car in around, and if there were no more cops, you'd get and you'd sit out and talk and, you know, have picnic style stuff with other gay people. And then, of course, because they had nowhere to go for sex in the woods, that's where sex would happen, right? Um, so to me, that was like a normal part of being a gay guy. Right, so for us on a date, you would go to that area and we'd have picnic and just hang out with friends, right? And the very first time, the very first time I go, they take me through this park and drive around. The first person I notice, my youth minister, hmm. standing there, not in the black with the white collar, regular clothes, tiny little shorts, like skimpy shorts, like hmm. we would say slutty, hmm. right? And I saw that, and I remember freaking out and ducking below the chair in the car because I didn't want my youth minister to see me and all of my friends in the car like bro he is here mm. he is gay too yeah. why are you hiding from him he is not hiding and I was just like Ugh. too much so that was the moment that I started I was like hold up when we're at church he tells me everything about gay is wrong but out here he is gay yeah something's wrong here yeah. something doesn't match so that's when I that was the moment where I was like that's it no more religion no more Catholic what feels in my heart is going to be what is right from now on, okay. not what people tell me. Okay. And then I know there are parents out there like me who have young children, uh -huh. and you may never know whether your child is gay or not. Is there anything you need to look for to know that your child is gay? Every parent knows. I, do not, I disagree with that statement. You will know. You will know. You are their parent. You have a heart that is their heart that is together. You know they are different. And you know in your heart that the way they are different is most likely this one way that is gay. What happens is what we call denial, right? Because you're a parent and you're of an age where gay is wrong. Gay does not happen. No gay children. It's, you are taught your entire life. No, 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 no. So you have a child and you see something and you're like, no, 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 no. You say to yourself, no, that's not it. It has to be something else. Mm -hmm. So first, when you say, uh, how do parents know? They know. They know already in their heart. Um, but truthfully, there is no way to know, right? So you know your child is different. Mm. Your child is different in what way? Who cares what way they're different? Mm. Hopefully a parent will support the child no matter how they're different. Um, I didn't know I was gay until I was 15, mm. officially. Maybe I was just a feminine artist someday, you know? But So there's only a, one way to know is to ask Mm. And you cannot ask a three-year-old, are you gay? They don't know, yeah. right? Um, so what do you look for to know your child is gay is your question. Um, I would look for interpersonal relationships. If you see your uh, child not following gender norms, you know, boys are supposed to play with cars and girls are supposed to play with dolls, right? If you find that your child is not playing, is playing with both, maybe put in the back of your mind, they might be gay. Let's be ready. Hopefully, if you're a good parent, a loving parent, to support that. So if they're not following gender norms, if you notice that they're forming personal relationships that uh, are with only same sex, right? Um, for me, I look back, my personal relationships with other boys were very different than friendship. To me, I thought they were my best friend. Yeah. When I look back, I know I, was, uh, I had a crush on them. I wanted, I wanted them to be my date. I didn't know then that's what I was feeling. But you could tell when you see boys interact. They're just friends, and then there's those two boys that are like, yeah, that's more than friends, yeah. right? Yeah. So maybe you can look for those ideas. Um, obviously, not following gender norms, yeah. right? If your household shows girls are one way and boys are another way, and they are not following that, maybe they are gay. Okay. Um, but there isn't... 
there isn't one thing. There isn't a thing that you can say, I'm watching and yes, I know he is gay. Mm. There is not one thing. Okay. I think it's in your heart. You know as a parent, you will know. Okay. So in the USA, there is a lot of freedom. Yeah. Uh, do you... For me, too much freedom, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So do you fear being gay here in the USA? So the USA is so big that it depends on where I live or depends on where I am traveling. So today, let's go backwards. 30 years ago, I was afraid every day, everywhere. No matter where I went, I was scared. My whole life, I was scared of who I am. I was scared of, uh, you know, negative things happening to me because of who I am. Nowadays, I'm not scared except for different areas, right? Um, the more uh, rural, away from the city you get, the more the chance you have of uh, being, uh, having negative things happen because you are gay. Um, in the United States, a little more south you get. It tends to be a little bit scary, right? So I know, um, like if I go to Philadelphia, right? I don't feel a scare to be gay in the city, but if I go into the ghetto, right? The, the, the bad part of town, I'm a little bit scared to be gay, right? That culture doesn't accept gay people as much. Mm -hmm. um, when I'm in uh, what we would call redneck country, do you know if I say redneck country? Like uh, people that are never been in the city, people yeah. that are like country only, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. like not in the city, we call them rednecks because okay. you know, like a farmer, he's in the sun all day. So only this part of his body is red. The rest is always white. Yeah. So that's the t nickname we say is a redneck. Okay. Um, so when I'm around rednecks or in redneck areas, um, I feel scared to be gay, but not every day. Yeah, but I normally see with a pink bug. Yeah, so yeah. Does that mean that you leave your pink or does that pink bug? Uh, that pink it? bag is a very specific thing that I chose to do. It was a, it was a, uh, it was a, an activism statement that I made. I right? think maybe so that we don't get into trouble, you can talk about it without referring to the employer. I'm not scared. Okay. okay. Yeah, I'm definitely going to refer to it because and I'll explain why I'm not scared. It has made a commitment to change the same ideas that I want to change. It has made a commitment to educate the people in the plant or the people within the company to help them understand that tolerance and acceptance for gay people is uh, the way they want their business to be run, yeah. right? So they want to make sure that uh, people like me don't feel unsafe at work, yeah. right? Um, so that, that pink backpack for me is a symbol of activism, right? It, when, you know, before it was okay to be gay, before the, there were gay rights, right? We would be in your face. We're here, we're queer, we're not going anywhere. So I went over the top being extra feminine, extra gay. You know what I mean? I would wear the pink, I would wear the sparkles just so everybody knew, yeah, I'm gay and you're not gonna pick on me because of it. That's, I was an activist, a gay rights activist. So now you fast forward to the pink back. I was scared for being gay. Yeah. There was a reputation in, in um, you know, in the history that uh, not just Harley Davidson, but the style, you know, a factory, right? A factory is where men work. Yeah. You know what I mean? A factory is where masculine men work. So I was afraid to walk into there as a gay person. I didn't know what it would be like politically or socially, mm -hmm. right? I expected it to be anti-gay. Um, and so when I got there, um, it was clear from the, uh, the leadership, our senior leadership and above, you know, we say the suits and ties, mm. the people that have desks, mm. up there, they, they were working hard to make sure gay people felt accepted at work. But in the real world where you and I work down in the factory, I did not feel that. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't until I started asking around and speaking, I realized there were other gay people there that were afraid to be themselves for the same reason I was afraid to be myself. Um, they were not comfortable being their authentic selves. And so, as is my natural my entire life, I will be an activist and I will change this. So I decided, if you're going to pick on me, if you're going to talk negative towards me for being gay, I'll show you how gay I can be. Let's see how uncomfortable I can make you. Mm. Right? Because you're making me uncomfortable for being me. So I'm going to make you feel uncomfortable for being you, was my idea. Mm. So I wear... Okay. Yeah, yeah, I wear this every day because apparently it's a gender norm 
Yeah. Only females should dress like this. Yeah. Only little young females should dress like this, yeah. right? Yeah. So when I wear it, it makes all of them stop and think, what is going on here? Just like you did. You had so many questions. And that's what I wanted every person there to know that, yeah, I'm gay. Yeah. And no matter how many times you tell me it's wrong, I'm proud to be gay and I'm going to show everybody I'm proud to be gay. And my hopes were that other people like me would realize okay, if he is comfortable being him and if he's ready to fight to be himself and not be picked on, maybe they will join me. And it worked. Because yeah. now we have a gay club, okay. right? We have a, a, a club where we meet and we talk about how can we help educate people in the plant to realize that before I'm gay, I am a human, okay. right? Before I'm gay, we are men, okay. right? Before they are gay, they are females and we're just humans together. And we're hopefully educate people to like understand. What, what, what I have learned my entire life is most people that have a problem with gay is because they are ignorant to the truth and they have not been exposed to it and people are afraid of the unknown. Okay. Uh, usually, if I, you know, am myself and then open and help educate them, they usually come to an understanding, okay, you're gay. My religion tells me that's not good, but that's you. I separate my religion. You know what I mean? For me, being gay is not okay. But for you, it is okay. That's where I want people to get to. And uh, that's what that was about. That was a way to start that conversation. But have you ever had a situation whereby somebody is unwilling to work, to work with you because you are gay? Yes. Absolutely. There are, there are situations in work where uh, one person was very uncomfortable uh, working next to somebody who was gay. So they switch. No big deal. Mm -hmm. Right. It was uh, the, the one specific instance was a mechanic. So, you know, where we work, mm -hmm. you know, in quality, we're at the end. Mm -hmm. Right. We stand at the end and there's a mechanic. So we find a defect and the mechanic fixes the defect. Um, this one mechanic just did not like me at all because I was well, he said because I was too gay. Okay. Right. Too gay or whatever that means. But I was gay enough that it made him uncomfortable. So instead of forcing him to work beside me, they gave him another position and they put another mechanic there who didn't give a care. Okay. Right. Um, there's a, a term that we said, what steams my clams, which is means what, what makes me angry is that I feel like I don't have the option of saying he is too straight. Mm -hmm. He is too masculine. I am uncomfortable. I don't want to work with him. I don't feel like I have that option, yeah. right? And certainly there is definitely not the option for uh, someone to say, I don't like working with black people. Yeah. He's too black for me, I cannot work with him. Yeah. Like, could you imagine if somebody said, I don't like working with black people and they gave him somewhere else to work so he didn't have to work next to you? Yeah. Yeah. So, bad, yeah. it feels weird, it feels bad, it doesn't yeah. feel accepting, does it? Mm -hmm. um, so the, the decision between me and the gay club and the senior leadership was more like, yes, we want to push it in the direction, but we can't go very fast. We have to start slow, mm -hmm. right? So the idea is uh, tolerance and acceptance. Like I don't expect people to agree with me being gay. I just want them to tolerate me being gay, right? So it's for me, uh, it's okay if you hate gay people. If that is your culture outside of work, that is okay. Here at work, we don't bring that culture here. We make the culture gray instead of black and white so that we can all live together. Um, so yes, people have chosen not to work beside me because I was gay. And yes, I have decided to allow that to happen as a stepping stone to teaching acceptance and tolerance. Okay. How do we say? I had to swallow a bitter pill. Yeah. yeah I did not like the idea that they were being given this choice but it seemed like an okay idea to let it happen as a stepping stone to perfection. Okay. Uh, before I came here, you know, I was asking questions to some guys in Kenya on the groups I belong. Oh, cool. So you got Maybe. questions from Kenyans? Yes. So That's exciting. Let me check them out. So my, my question would be, so you were, you, were, you were telling people in Kenya in these groups that you're, you have a gay person at work? No. And you're speaking to them? Or? The, the, question, uh, the, the question I asked is that I'm going to interview, not to interview, to have a conversation yeah. with a gay personality, if you have any questions. Okay. So this one has written in the local language, I may not translate, but there is this one here in English, he says, so what determines or which factors are considered to be a man or a wife? Do they change roles at any particular point in life? So, what I'm seeing is, uh, 
your culture in Kenya is still very attached to the idea of gender roles. They're very attached to this idea that men are masculine and women are feminine. Yeah. And that is not my reality. There are some men that are feminine and there are some women that are masculine. So for me, the answer to that question might be more cultural and less time of life. Mm. Right? They, the question was, does, as at some point, does that change in life? Um, for me, that's, that would be a cultural idea. So in the beginning, I was raised that, you know, a man is a man and he is masculine and a female is feminine and the masculine takes care of the fem feminine and the feminine stays home and the man, and that's the way it always is. It doesn't change, as the person would ask. Um, it changed for me because when you're gay, most of the time your family does not accept you. Yeah. So now I have no family. So we end up choosing our own family. I have gay friends and f people that are straight, that are gay friendly, that I have chosen to replace my family, right? So then I got to learn a different culture. And so that culture was, there is no difference between masculine and feminine. Mm -hmm. There is no gender or role difference between man and woman, okay. husband and wife. It is always equal, it is always the same. Okay. So the answer is culture, not mm -hmm. time. Okay. And then the other question is, uh, somebody has asked here is uh, whether gay people reproduce, whether they have children. Okay. So that is a whole other idea. Um, remember I talked about the white picket fence gays? Yes. Right? They're the ones that want the idea of the American family, right? The American family. If we say the, the American dream without gender roles, right? You have two people that take care of each other that work together, they have a family with children, that idea. Um, so there are, there are gay people that, that like this idea of, of raising children, but how do we have children, mm -hmm. right? How do I have children? I cannot get pregnant, yeah. right? My husband could not get pregnant. Yeah. So there are many different ways that each gay family chooses to introduce children into the family. Okay. Um, the, some of the most common ways are um, uh, surrogacy, right? They have... Uh, 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 and and uh, what's uh, in vitro fertilization? Okay. So that's like one of the most common ways. Plus, there's also adoption, okay. right? Um, and then there's also a lot of gay guys are, are gay, even or, or straight until they're married and have their own children, okay. right? And so now you have a gentleman that has his own children, and now he marries another gentleman. So there's already children involved. Okay. So like three three or so different ideas of how to introduce children. Um, some reproduce in a way that, do, would you call it reproducing if um, like I chose a female to donate eggs and then my sperm fertilizes those eggs and then those eggs go into another female, she is the, the surrogate mother and then when the baby is born, they give the baby back to me and my husband. Would you call that reproducing? I think it's a way, a way of re reproduction. Yeah, it's so. reproduced. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we reproduce, okay. right? Um, when I was married, when I had a husband, uh, we thought we were white picket fence. We wanted to, we wanted the American dream. And so we chose the idea. We called it the old fashioned way. Yeah. So if we wanted to have children, we knew we were going to, um, invite a female that was a friend, mm. right. To have sex with me. And then the baby would become ours and hers. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So then you have this idea of a, a different relationship. So that's the idea. That's how we chose, we wanted to reproduce, was the old-fashioned way. Have sex, have a baby, that's it. Um, others do it differently. They do in vitro fertilization, they do adoption, they do all of that. Okay. Then there is another one here. I'll just ask it, but I don't know whether I'll be able to put it because um, uh, it's a funny question. He's asking... Like, no, uh, to perform oral sex on somebody else or on me or...? Yeah, something like that. Their job? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Oral sex. Okay. Okay. So it's just your accent. So what? Tell me the question again. Do 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 you have that kind of job? Of course. Mm. Oh yeah. It seems that is the most interesting part. What do you mean? From there you responded. It appears like it's very interesting. I don't know. Mm. I love receiving and I love giving. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let me check with. Uh... I'm curious. Why are the the ones that are. Uh, in, the, in the, the local language that need translated. Okay. Would you try? Yes, I'll... I'll, I'll okay. Uh, uh, I think they are basically the same, but I will. Yeah, there's this one here. 
I think you've answered, but maybe let me ask it. He's asking, how was you, how were you introduced into gayism, and at what age? Okay, right. So gayism, I like that. Um, just for curiosity's sake, do you speak the language well enough for me to hear the question in this language? No, I haven't. I haven't. That one I'll, I'll translate. Okay. This one is a different one, but I'll translate. Okay. Um, so how was I introduced to gayism? Uh, I think just like anybody else, it's, uh, you know, American TV, radio, popular culture. Um, I, I was not introduced to the sexual part of it until I had a date, a, fr a, a boyfriend, you know? Okay. So, and because I was so young when I figured it out, it wasn't about sex. You know what I mean? I just knew that I wanted a relationship with another boy and that I wanted to like create what everybody else had, these, but with another man, not with another girl. So um, I was in, introduced to, to gay basically by popular culture. But I think the question they're asking is about sex, yes. right? How did I figure out about gay sex? Mm. Um, and I didn't, just like every normal child, they don't think about sex. You know, when a little girl and a little boy are holding each other's hands, do you think they're talking about... No, no they're too young to talk about that. Mm -hmm. So it's the same way for me. Um, it was just normal and natural, and then I saw it and figured out that's what I was. Okay. Okay, then there is also another one here which is interesting. You'll, you'll learn a lot of Kenyan terminologies today. Cool. Ask him what turns him on. Is it beauty? Is it nyash? Dashboard like some of us? Or does he have any specific things? So I'll translate. Yeah. So he's asking, what turns you on? Yeah. Is it the beauty of somebody? Th then he's talking about something called Nyash. Yeah. Nyash is a woman who has huge hips. Yeah. Uh, and then dashboard is now what you talked about, the chest, what is on the chest. Okay. So what turns you on? So, and so tell, me again, that tell, me again, then, tell me again, how do I say the name for the big? Nyash. Nyash. Yes. Nyash. 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 Yes. Nyash. Well, for men, I like nyash. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> oh, on a man, I like a big, juicy, muscular. Oh, yeah, I like that. Um, for women, I don't prefer large breasts. I like a sort of smaller breasts. But the truth is, what turns me on is um, the experience, the connection. For, I'm not very visual when it comes to that. You know what I mean? Because there are guys with no nyash. Yeah. But I'm still sexually attracted to them for other reasons. Um, but that's cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, I like big too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like nyash. Yeah, I do. <laughs> um, let me see whether the... Okay, now you, you wanted me to translate the other ones, but I think they may have been answered, but let me... Well, I just want to hear them in your language, in, in their language. language. Yeah. Okay, I'll read them in Swahili. Our language is Swahili. Okay. Um, so, uh, he actually has four questions. So the first one, Mamake. Nababake, wakohai. That question is, is your father and your mother still alive? That is number one. Uh -huh. The second one is, yeye ndiyo muke ama mume. So he's asking, are you the wife or are you the husband in this relationship? Okay. Um, and then, uh, this one I think is truly religious because he's asking whether uh, gay people are mentally okay. Okay, uh, that makes uh, sense. In Swahili, he's asking, Kama ako sawa kiakili. So it's, uh, he's asking whether um, gay people are mentally okay. And so that's a, a common question for people who are uh, naive or ignorant or uneducated about gay people. Um, and it's interesting that you say that because in the past, gay was considered a mental disability. Yes. Right? In the past, it, w it was definitely considered not normal, and it was definitely considered bad, and it was definitely considered um, we were not mentally okay in the past. Um, we have educated ourselves medically, and we have educated ourselves socially, so now we know it's not a mental disorder, but there are still people today that believe that, yes. right? And there's still people today that judge me as if I was mentally disabled because I choose, choose to be gay, yeah. right? Um, so my, my answer is, there's just as many crazy gay guys as there are crazy straight guys. Okay. There's, you know, there are mentally 
disturbed gay people and there are mentally disturbed straight people, okay. right? Um, but I do understand the question. The, the, the core of the question is um, it comes from naivete or comes from uh, ignorance, right? Of they don't understand. They probably just don't know enough gay people or open gay people, you know? Do you think I'm mentally disturbed? No. Oh, answer the question honestly. I'm a little bit mentally disturbed now. No. No, okay. <laughs> actually, actually uh, from where we work, people find you as somebody who is really outgoing. Yes. Mm. Um, like I was asking somebody today uh, what kind of questions I should ask you. Then he, she, she told me, if it's Jason, just let him talk. <laughs> true. That yeah. is very true, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. That's cool. Um, but I like the other one. The first question was... Uh, Whether your parents are still alive. But... So, my mother is not. My father is. Um, my mother died because of breast cancer. Okay. So, Sorry. that was 11 or 12 years ago. So, I would have been 30-something when she passed away. Okay. And then, the, the second question was, am I the husband or the wife? Yes. So, my first relationship, I was definitely considered the wife. In this relationship, if people are watching from the outside yeah. and they see, if it looks like I am the husband role and he is the wife role. So I change. My first relationship, I was a wife. My second relationship, I was a husband, okay. right? But the truth is, um, we just do what is our strengths, right? I'm good at, you know, budget. I'm good at finances. I'm good at fixing things, mm. right? So I do that stuff, mm. right? I cannot stand, I hate doing dishes. Yeah. Don't ask me why. He likes doing dishes. Yeah. So he does the dishes, right? So it seems as if he is the wife mm. and I am the husband. But when it comes to decision making, it's very equal. Okay. Right? Okay. That's okay. cool. I love that question. I love that question <laughs> because it comes from ideas of the past. It comes from ideas of gender norms. Mm. And I certainly, obviously, do not subscribe to gender norms. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, let me, let me see my pink slippers, yeah. right? My pink backpack, yeah. right? I do everything, not everything, but there's a lot of things I do that are typically feminine. Yeah. Like when you first met me at work, did you think I was feminine? Actually, to be honest, it's uh, your partner who told me that I have my boyfriend down there. So okay. I didn't know. So I was asking people, uh, who, who is the boyfriend? Okay. Then actually a certain lady told me that um, he's a certain guy with beards and a tummy. So I was wondering, does uh, gay people also look at the tummy? So, yes, but not all of the gays, right? So we use words to describe certain types of persons, right? And for some reason we use, we, we describe them as animals, mm. right? So there would be like a, a, an otter in, in, the, in the wild, an otter is a skinny animal right? Who has a lot of hair. So if you see a tall, skinny man with a lot of hair, you would call him an otter. And there are some people that prefer to have sex or prefer to date otters, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and then there's uh, like the, you know, popular culture, the perfect, perfect one, which is, you know, they're, they're fit, they're muscular, they're thin, they're chiseled, like you would see on the models on TV. And some people prefer that. And so what's the word? What do we call those guys? Like the, the, the jocks, Mm -hmm. Right, that they look like a jock, or I would say a, there's a word that we say circuit queen, which is like a, a feminine jock. And there are some people that prefer that. The word that gay people use to describe me and all other men who have a belly and who have chest hair and fur, they call us a bear. Because mm -hmm. in the wild, what is a bear? A bear is a big animal with a big belly and lots of fur, yeah. right? And so I am lucky that somebody as pretty and young as Joey is actually into bears. He prefers, he, he's turned on by bears. Okay. Yeah. Lucky like, me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like the word turned on. But so the, yeah, bellies is a thing. They love the belly. Okay. But, I don't know why. <laughs> but the, the other question is, is there anything that you regret about your life? Anything that you regret about? Very poignant question. And immediately my answer is no. There, I have done many bad things. I have made many poor decisions. You know, there was a point in my life that I was in jail, mm. right? There was a point in my life that I was homeless because I was addicted to drugs. Um, there was a point in my life where I was making very poor decisions and I was hanging out with gang members and stealing money and, and you know, selling drugs and you know how they do in the streets, the gang. I, I made very poor decisions. And the other parts of my life where I made great decisions. The reason why I say no, I do not regret anything, is because 
I'm very proud who I am today. And everything that happened made me who I am today. And all of the poor decisions, because I had to survive them, made me strong today. Yeah, yeah. So I do not regret a single thing. Um, however, I do know there are many people that I owe an apology to. Mm. Okay. So what would you tell them, those whom you owe an apology, in case they have, have a chance right. to watch you? So the, the, to, to anybody that I have disrespected or have done wrong to, um, the biggest apology or the most honest apology that I can say is, I'm sorry for being so young. I'm sorry for being so stupid. I'm sorry for being so close-minded that I didn't see the bigger picture and I made a poor decision that affected you. The best thing that I can say is once I realized my decisions were wrong and what I was doing was wrong, I've done everything I can to become a better person today. And uh, if there's anybody out there that I have uh, disrespected that um, would want an apology, I would definitely welcome the chance to not only just apologize, but to build a friendship or a relationship where we can build common trust and common respect to hopefully erase what I have done in the past. Okay. Okay. Uh, I know many people in Africa, you know, the thing of being gay is uh, something new that is not even there. So people will be surprised that I have sat with a gay person. No, sure. For the record, I'm yeah. not gay at all. Fair. Yeah. Fair, right? So people will ask, are you sure you left there when you are safe? Because, you know, people will say, uh, that guy must have seen and say, ah, Bonventure, you look nice. They'll ask, were you safe when you were with him? So I would say to them, well, or to you, you think you're special and I'm attracted to you? No. <laughs> you have no worries. <laughs> yeah. yeah um, it's, so it, it's the same thing happens here. The same thing happens. There are um, many men who I speak to, you know, we talk, we chat, like in groups, yeah. but they don't want anybody to know. They have, okay. for the same reason. Yeah. Their family's going to ask him, are you safe? Is he going to try and make you gay? Yeah. I cannot make you gay. Yeah. You were born gay, yeah. right? And if you're not born gay, you're straight, and I'm not going to change that for you. Mm -hmm. um, but it's common. I hear it all the time. Okay. Yeah, it's the same here. Okay. Here's more of a joke. Do they say it seriously or is it joking when they say it in, in Kenya? No, it will be serious. They'll say, no it. Shit. Okay. Yeah, they'll say it seriously. Like in they're fact, actually worried about you yeah. because you're sitting next to me and they're yeah. worried that I want to have sex with you. They may think so. Huh? Yeah. No. <laughs> I mean, not this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so as we conclude, I don't know that there is anything you wanted to talk about that I haven't talked about. Um... Uh, but as you think about that... So I do have, like, like I did think about it, because I knew you were going to ask me that question. And so, for me, there's this idea of what is culturally appropriate and what do individuals do. So I know that it's culturally inappropriate in Kenya to be gay. Mm. It is not appropriate to be open about being gay. But is every individual that you know think the same way? Or are there some individuals that separate from culturally appropriate and in their mind they accept gay people even though in Kenya it is not supposed to be accepted. Are there people like that? Do you know people? Uh, I may not know them individually but I know there are gay, gay people in Kenya and mm -hmm. they don't come out in the, in the open of course. because uh, the, the society will not accept them. Are there non-gay people that are accepting of gay people even though it is culturally not appropriate? I think they are. You think that, but you don't know any? No, I don't know. You any. don't know a single one? It's only maybe through allegations. You okay. Know, it, it will be allegations. So it's so that close. So it's, so it's, yeah. it's, oh, wow. Yeah. So very personal question. Yeah. Um, if we were in Kenya and you and I met, would you have responded as friendly? If you would, be, would you be so as nice to me as you are now? I would still be nicely, n nice to you, but definitely, maybe we could not have done this interview. That makes sense. Because the society will not... You would not, be, you would not want to be seen side by side with a yes. gay man because of the allegations they would make for you. Yes. <sighs> That's disappointing. What's m not disappointing, what gives me hope is this. There's a man like you that wants Kenya to see that the world is bigger than Kenya and that the culture in Ke Kenya is only one culture. There are very many more cultures in the world. And once you travel and see more cultures, you tend to realize that my culture 
is not the only way. And what I think is right isn't always right in another culture. And what I think is wrong is not always wrong in another culture. And so even though today Kenya is what I would say behind the times, still closed-minded, um, it gives me hope that there's people like you that want to meet and talk with me and, and hopefully educate Kenya so that even if they don't change their mind to accept gay people, maybe they understand that I'm human before I am gay. Mm. And then uh, one allegation that happens in Kenya is that uh, those people who are gay, not just in Kenya but in Africa, mm -hmm. in Kenya and Uganda, they have associations. So people say that these uh, associations receive a lot, of, a lot of funding from the from the West. So like Americans here will fund those gay activities in Africa. I don't know specifically about that. Um, I do know that uh, there are outreach programs, right, um, that reach out to other countries and do whatever they can to support gay people that are not being supported by their own culture. Um, what I think I'm hearing, though, is uh, they think Westerners are giving money to support gay sex. Yes. Right? It's not about gay sex. It's about human rights. Right? There are plenty of gay people who have no sex at all. Mm. No sex. Mm. But they're still gay. Mm. They still have interpersonal relationships with the same sex. Mm. Right? So... I don't think there's Westerners throwing money to like make gay sex happen. They're throwing money and supporting to help human rights happen, mm. equality happen. Okay. Okay. I want to appreciate you for giving me this time to talk to you. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. You know, you've learned a few things, and I've learned a few. Absolutely. Things. Yeah. 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 So I'm sure when you see a Kenyan, you'll know there is something called nyash. Yeah, <laughs> I forgot the name. Yes, I, that, I have to, gosh. You know I'm going to say that to you at work now. Yeah. So, personal question. For females, do you like gosh? Uh, 